segmented depending on the different uh, processes. This has happened over the past 30 or 40 years. There are subsystems that don't articulate a, well. It's uh, very fragmented access is not always the best. There are financial considerations and the coverage capacities of the different health systems are limited in most countries. In, in terms of investments, uh, they've been too low over the past uh, few years in health. Uh, PAHO has always they recommended at least 6% of GDP is public expenditure on health and on average, uh, it's quite a bit uh, lower, which shows there is a scarcity then of resources being allocated to the health uh, system in what one might call more normal uh, times. So the system uh, is not right now in the, in the capacity to uh, ensure universal health uh, coverage. And uh, of course, it's quite uh, over its head right now uh, with the outbreak of this COVID pandemic. Another uh, existing problem, and it's not unique to the region, but it's the availability of the different instruments, medicines, tools needed to deal with the pandemic. And of course, the world demand for all of these has uh, just skyrocketed and the availability then of these products, uh, especially uh, technological uh, uh, products, uh, have been vastly surpassed. And this then, together with the uh, networks associated uh, to different types of equipment in some countries uh, has then influenced, has, for example, countries that produce certain uh, equipment has decided to limit the export of these, uh, this type of equipment. And that has, of course, limited access to them in uh, other usually poorer countries. And that is why uh, many countries in the region have begun uh, processes of technological innovation. And here I would like to acknowledge this is really important in terms of public policy to uh, stimulate uh, technological innovation to respond uh, at internal level to the kind of challenges that we now face. And based, of course, on uh, local uh, needs. Associated with this, we have a very important uh, challenge in the context and the pressure that exists how we can ensure quality uh, of the uh, equipment that is being produced and what are the quality criteria that we need to employ? What are the eligibility criteria for countries? Uh, and what, what, what solutions do we recommend? What do the national authorities recommend? Not just help, but uh, other parts of the state as well regarding the development of these technologies. And so this is an intersectoral uh, health science and technology dialogue uh, where we need to work based on the, the needs in the different systems and see what the norms and technical requirements are regarding the, uh, the quality products that need to be produced and that may save lives in this country. This is an intersectoral dialogue where the uh, capacity regarding the mobilization of national the actors in the science sector, the industrial sector, to respond to this uh, demand from the health sector. So it is in this context that uh, through the uh, sanitary unit at PAHO, we have called for this first 
discussion with you uh, to exchange uh, information on the different uh, projects. I would like to acknowledge and thank all participants in the session. And you're uh, obviously shown your commitment uh, given the demand and we draw attention to the need to continue working in this direction for your information. We continue working strongly and closely uh, with the different uh, regulating authorities and all indeed uh, regulatory uh, agencies, whether national or regional. Um, and this is uh, in terms of specifications, norms, and the preparation uh, of the products, and of course also surveillance in terms of their efficacy and use. So this collaboration uh, between health and technology has different dimensions and angles, and we're very, very pleased to be able to facilitate this uh, dialogue with you. With that then, thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Colleagues on the panel, I'll uh, leave it there. And uh, I'm going to be with you for uh, an hour or so. Unfortunately, I can't be with you for the entire session, but uh, I'm very, very interested in uh, hearing what you have to say, both in the science and health sectors in the region. Thank you very kindly for your attention. Thank you, James. My name is Thomas Pipo. I am a regional advisor on a technology and innovation in the PAHO. James has basically already told us what this is about, what the aims are, and the intention behind the work we are carrying out at PAHO in particular. And again, to share experiences on how countries are facing and dealing with the challenges uh, regarding the need for ventilators to deal with the pandemic. The meeting will be divided in three parts. We will now five minutes real quick. Uh, Alexander will uh, sort of go over some of the different activities we'll be, we're doing uh, from uh, PAHO. And then we'll enter to the meat of the matter one is a block of authorities from the different governments and countries. Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Uruguay, and so on. And they will tell us what their governments are doing and the preparation that they are doing. And then in the second block, we will hear one of the innovative products regarding uh, ventilators physically designed for this particular pandemic. And these are initiatives thought as a response uh, to COVID-19. And then finally, uh, I just a few things you might want to take into account. The meeting has a, a, in a, a simultaneous interpretation. We have something like, if I'm, uh, I think something like 85 or, or, or 90 participants. And I would ask you to make an effort to speak uh, at some sort of a normal and reasonable pace to give the interpreters a, a chance to get a word in edgewise. And especially the, the panelists. No, I think you're all in good locations uh, and make sure you're in the chat room where, where you are going to speak you're, and don't be in the wrong one uh, when it comes to your uh, turn. Regarding the auditorium, the questions, please send them to us uh, in writing via uh, chat and there is like a little place there for, for, for you to put messages. And again, please, uh, any questions in a written form. 
And without going to into further any further ado, uh, we give the floor back to uh, Alexandre. Thank you, uh, Thomas. I forgot to uh, introduce myself at the beginning. I'm uh, Alexander Lem Gruber, a regional uh, advisor in uh, sanitary technology. I'm based in uh, Washington. I'm very pleased to be with you. And those of you who have slides, please pass them on. So as has already been uh, mentioned, we have several challenges in the region, and ventilators is one of them. We don't have much time. I'm not going to get into great detail. But there are the different regulatory frameworks that countries have on this uh, clinical management, uh, technical issues uh, when it comes to innovative uh, products. Could we go to the next slide, please? And we won't be able to go into much uh, detail. So I am just going to concentrate on what we're talking about today. But here you can see some results. Um, and the, you will, of course, be receiving all this uh, information. And in this case, we defined specifications about uh, ventilators uh, in the context of COVID. And you can see here an example of these uh, specifications uh, for uh, and, and the list of, of priority uh, medical devices in the context of coronavirus. Here you can see uh, this is a list of uh, very useful regarding the different uh, the things that these ventilators have or can do, the name of the, of the medical device, it's, uh, whether it's for triage and uh, initial approaches, or whether it's for taking uh, samples or diagnostics and so on. And this is here then are some uh, eligibility uh, criteria for the evaluation of these tools that PAHO has in the region based on basic quality uh, uh, criteria. So these are eligibility criteria for the acquisition of mechanical ventilators in the context of COVID-19. And there's also a document already published with authorities, uh, sent by the authorities on the regulation of ventilators uh, and, and the different, uh, the different uh, regulating authorities in the uh, countries, different countries on this particular uh, issue. Here is then the specific line of work, and these are then the innovative uh, initiatives and production of these ventilators in the region. We, in this uh, initiative, have identified a number of initiatives and these through these we were able to establish direct contact with the groups responsible for the product for 20 of these projects and that is why we held a first uh, virtual uh, meeting on 9 April 2020 and we for set up a working group, we had video conferences and other types of information. And these 20 projects in general would make some comments. For example, of these 20, nine are uh, open to transfer technology. These are open platforms that are already available for transfers. In terms of the in developing institutions, 
we had from uh, universities, hospitals, uh, industry, and there was collaboration between uh, academe and the uh, industry. So there's different types of collaboration that we are going to have today at this uh, session. Also, we'll be hearing about different experiences and regarding uh, the types of ventilators, we have uh, invasive, uh, non-invasive, and uh, ventilators that can be used in both ways. And then in terms of the ventilation principle, we have uh, mechanized uh, machine ventilators and those that can be uh, adapted. So just very general. No? And now we can take a look at some of the projects. And here you can see the projects that we identified and uh, were able to acquire information about. And we have to acknowledge there are many, many more. And uh, the four countries that will be in the first panel will show and point out that there are many others. But these 20 projects uh, were basically information that we were able to gather. We did then a matrix, uh, produced a matrix with the number of uh, parameters. And uh, today we're going to be rather general about this and not as technical as when we had meetings specifically only with uh, each, of the, each of the projects. And like that, share the information on you. So as you can see, Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, Brazil, Mexico, Trinidad and Tobago, Uruguay, the United States, and Spain. An example from outside the region, because it seemed to us interesting to also include a non-regional uh, country and then uh, exchange perspectives and uh, experiences. So that's why we have Spain, but all others are in fact from the region and we continue to gather experience. And then, okay, there's one more. And then what did we do? We uh, evaluated, and of course that changes, this information changes every day, but basically one can see different stages. There's some that they started a short time ago, uh, others are still in the design phase, others are already uh, producing simulators, others are already uh, doing clinical research uh, on humans, having gone to the stage of animals, and then some are already, in five cases, already being uh, manufactured. So, uh, some, as I say, already have authorization and uh, are being. Uh, in the stage of being engaged or contracted with the, 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 the respective governments. So, as you can see, since the last meeting, I mean, what, what, what are we doing? Uh, we are creating this uh, platform and generate also a comments and, and technology transfer in the support of this uh, process and discussion around uh, innovation. With that, I conclude my uh, initial presentation and give the word to my colleagues who are going to moderate the session. So, as you can see, we're going to begin with the first block. Mm -hmm. As you can see here, the Urtal, working with the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation of Argentina, Jose Contillo, working with the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovations and Communications of Brazil. Dr. Carola Medina, 
Director of Innovation of the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Telecommunications of Costa Rica, and Maria Jose Gonzalez from the Ministry of Industry, Energy, and Mining from the Republic of Uruguay. The idea is to start commenting a little bit how from the government, uh, each country is generating a response to the pandemic in terms of covering the needs for ventilators. The responses are very different between each country uh, that maybe has a pre-existing condition of uh, capabilities for responding to emergencies that require ventilators and countries that don't have that pre-established uh, circumstance or capabilities. And with the coordination of these areas that, as you can see, are usually coordinated, at least in the cases that we have uh, coordinated with the speakers today, it's usually efforts that are coordinated from not the Ministry of Health, but from another ministry. And these are fundamental uh, role uh, actors or or role um, players that are going to really help alleviate the situation and they need to provide the support to the health sector. Um, we, were, we will begin with Argentina. Diego, please, let's begin. We'll give you the floor. Or actually, before we begin, there will be a, some time at the end of each block for about 20 minutes to answer some questions. We ask that the presentations be between eight and 10 minutes. Um, I would think that when there's a few minutes um, before the, the amount of time allotted for the presentations are up, I will let you know, not to interrupt you, but just so that you are aware that your time is coming to an end. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the OPS. Let me begin by giving you some context of Argentina. Today, in Argentina, the amount of people that have been that have been infected is about 20,000, and 6,000 people that have been recovered that have recovered. So we have about 13,500 people that are currently undergoing the viral process and we have 615 deceased. So this allows us to uh, understand that we are still uh, at, a, at a point where we could still have um, a collapse of the medical system, but if we control the quarantine, then we can still have or maintain the medical system working in a positive way for the the population. In Argentina, we have ventilators that can work at two types of ventilators, ventilators that can work for assisted breathing or on orders. When we talk about assistant, assistive uh, breathing support, it means that it detects the needs of each patient. So in this context, we provided support to the company that, the, that has the biggest production of ventilators so that by March and April, this company, this private company could duplicate the amount of ventilators that they could, that they could produce so that we can keep the flow of ventilators going and be able to provide it to the health system as the amount of patients that needed it would increase. We also provided technical support as well, developing a different valve so that this valve could block, could be blocked, for example. We had a group of engineers that would work on that aspect as well. And this is the most important support because this is, these are the ventilators that are authorized by the National Authority in Medical 
and uh, medical equipment. So there were some projects within the public sector that went on or that started popping up. And these projects that today are being implemented or are going through a process of uh, implementation, which I will explain later what that means, are all working at a, mand a mandatory level. Meaning that the assisted mode is very sophisticated and at this moment we're trying to respond to the emergency and not trying to go for the more sophisticated assisted breathing uh, ventilator. So we have ventilators that work with valves. We have three different models in Argentina. Two public universities developed two of the models with the, the support of the private sector. And when I say private sector, it's companies that are very linked to the universities and a third ventilator with a uh, Yambu valve. And so when we have a, when we have the two models for yeah, with a Yambu valve, we're talking about ventilators that require another measure, uh, an extra piece to measure the flow of air. And then we have another a model that has a valve that can do that automatically. When we talk about the ventilators with the MVU valve, we have we had six prototypes. Out of those six prototypes, after the performing some follow-up, close follow-up um, by accessing by accessing videos taken and also doing some field work where it was possible, we were able to understand which of the six models of the AMBU type needed support. And then four of them were working properly. And one of them was the most adv advanced. And so in general, the three Vol ventilators and the three MVU ventilators are in the process of being certified. When I say certification in these seven models, I mean that the certification that we are looking for are minimum clinical prerequisites, which are safety and efficiency for a last resort. I think I'm almost done. Um, I'm measuring my time and I think I had eight minutes. There is a private company, Adox, that is very important in Argentina, with, involved with metallurgy and that develops anesthetic dosifiers. And they have started developing a kit for valves um, that allow to that allow us to do the to adequate the adequate the anesthetic machines to ventilators. And I finish with the fact that in the case of adult, sorry, for the anesthetic uh, respirators, we understand that this process of adequating them to be to becoming ventilators is a lot faster. And continuing to my last point, we understood that we needed to develop a valve where one ventilator could be used by two patients. And this was developed in Italy and Austria. And so we it came to Argentina. It followed a very complex process of testing with of fake lungs with animals and now with well, human volunteers and it's now in the process of being put into practice and we hope we don't have to use it but definitely these are technologies of, of last resort that we are 
getting ready. And then we also have uh, technology being developed for, for compassionate support. And we are, we are moving forth so that we can have a process of, of certification that lasts only six months. And that's, that's my last <laughs> remark. And thank you. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Your time was excellent, actually. So thank you for sticking to our time frame. Those of you who have questions, you can go ahead and place them in the chat. So that please, but also before you, you put your question, please uh, say your name and your institution so that we know uh, where you're, who you are and, and to be able to answer these questions so that, you know, we definitely understand that even though we are in a remote experience we try to stay as close as we can okay so our next our next presenter is jose jose contigo and he will he accompanies us from brazil so please go ahead jose uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, it's a pleasure to be here with our colleagues uh, here in brazil we have this task force uh, not only our ministry, but uh, many ministries engaged to to fight against this challenge that we are in this moment. So, uh, we in the long, long ventilator strategy, we have uh, started as a, with premises and the challenges that we have, and establish a framework. Uh, can you pass, please? Well, the premises that we have is uh, we have uh, actually uh, three types of ventilators, and the third one is the AMBU automat automatization. That uh, probably most part of the initiatives worldwide are this kind of, of initiative. But in our view, uh, for COVID, uh, the adequate one is the intensive use one and emergency and transport one. Because they are invasive, uh, the risk of air contamination are very low. The AMBU, even the automated one, the risk of contaminating the air, and then the medical, the, the, the other patient gets injured is very high. Uh, the, and it's recommended to be used uh, not more than six hours, the automated AMBU. So we focus on the intensive use and transport emergency. Next one. Uh, this is our requirement. I, I will not read that, but only to let you know, we, are, we have a regula, le, regulatory agency and it looks the the WTO uh, requirement and also we follow MHR from UK uh, requirement. This is the target, of course, for the moment that we, we have, some of the requirements can be uh, uh, be more flexible, but uh, we have to have the in mind that some kind of requirement cannot be uh, be put outside because uh, the COVID maneuver in the lung of the patient can can be the the, the game change and life or death. Next one, please. In Brazil, only to let you know, we have already we had already a, a, a industry that are were manufacturing. Uh, ventilators annually, they, their productions are around five to five to five thousand. Uh, they have around eight hundred employers, and the annual revenue are were around seventy-four million. Uh, the Minister of Health uh, asked to us to provide thirty thirty thousand uh, ventilators in forty-five days when the, all this crisis starts. Uh, half of it will be was supposed to be imported, and the other half. Uh, in the national production. What happens is the imported ones, uh, we have the same problem worldwide, so it's a very challenging one. Uh, the Minister of Health didn't buy anyone for imported ones. They, the states are trying to do that, but look into that and look at that, we have also the private uh, hospitals, the municipality, the state hospitals, not only the federal government hospitals, uh, 
uh, that expected to be more 20k uh, ventilators, we change our focus and to try to improve the production of this Brazilian industry. Next one. So what we did, we we get a group. All this group you know, in the top of the, the slide are ministry and institutions in Brazil, the Minister of Science and Technology, the Prime Minister Gabinet, Minister of Health, Minister of Economy, Foreign, Mini Foreign Relations Ministry, Minister of Defense, the regula regulatory and, and standardization institutions, the funding institutions, the R&D institutions. So everyone together uh, work in four main pillars. One is how to improve the production, that 5,000 5, annual productions, to produce more than 20,000 in two, two months, around two months. And what we did is we, we, we call many other companies from uh, and other areas that manufacture another kind of goods, such as smartphones, engines, motors, uh, and, and they have a huge uh, manufacturing plants in Brazil, and they start to help all those small companies to, to evaluate their production. Uh, we had the bottleneck regarding the components and, and funding and how we can bring back the, the, the labor force without getting them injured from COVID. So we have all this, this working force. And the second pillar is how to help uh, the companies, private companies that want to donate to the, to the government ventilators. So, and to the state and to the municipality. So we are trying to help them sending airplanes to China, to everywhere, to bring these this products, to help them with the customs facilitation, and also talking with the traders. They're probably, every country is passing to that. Uh, uh, many people are coming to the government, bringing magical amounts of ventilators, trying to sell it to us. And we are trying to help Minister of Health to evaluate the, the accurate, accuracy of these proposals or if it's fake or not and, and so on. Another pillar is the maker community. They are doing 3D printing. They are trying to develop components. They are developing uh, personal protection equipment and so on. So the, the four pillar are the alternative ventilators. So we have the, the industry that already work in, in the ventilator productions, and we move forward to see what, uh, what would be the help that the academia and the R&D centers together with other industries could prepare to Brazil. And there are a lot of requirements for health uh, certification, and we, we help them to do that. Next, please. So what we did, uh, for the, the first pillar, we had all these these companies in the right part of the slide that are not from uh, health industry and they help the health industry in the left side to increase their production. So today we have a red contract, uh, 60,750 uh, ventilator from those companies. Uh, we are, uh, we are all, all also uh, repairing uh, around 3,000 ventilators. So we reach with this around 20,000 ventilators. Uh, there are two, two more under negotiation with the Ministry of Health, and these alternative ventilators, we're expecting to buy another 5,000 ventilators. We are up to reach 30,000 in, in, in a few, few weeks. We, we expect that. Let's see how the evaluation of the certification of these alternative ventilators will move on. And the, the main uh, critic components are pressure and flow valve, sensors, HMF filters, and the main vendors that have these, these critical components are Hanoi, North Green, and Parker. Next one. So what we did, we, we get Brazil, we joined this group. We have, I, I personally talk around uh, with around uh, 80, 80 uh, in, uh, initiative. More part of them are uh, AMBU automatization. And this, is, this, this was not our target, but uh, for emergency, a very, very uh, critical uh, situation when no, 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 no way that we have some kind of ventilator. It could be used, but uh, it's not more than six hours. It can injure even more the lung of the, of the patient. So 
we focus on the, the, the initiatives that were more mature, and these are the, the one in our view that are more mature. The blue ones have already got the certification. They are starting the negotiation of the Minister of Health. And the other one with the green, green, green circle, they are almost getting their certification. Most part of them have already submitted the, 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 the documents to get the register and certification in our regulatory institution. Next one, please. To help the Minister of Health, we get all these 8080 uh, initiatives and make some, some kind of survey, uh, getting the main uh, characteristics of, of each uh, ventilator, the cost, who will manufacture, in which stage of certification. And we, it's a live uh, uh, document. Every week we update it and send it to the Minister of Health to help them to get the decisions. Next one, please. And then uh, we, 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 we figured that the initiatives need help to uh, uh, consolidate their projects, to help them to evaluate their projects, to test, to get the conformity certifications, to test uh, electromagnetic fields, a, a, every kind of test. So we passed 5 million uh, uh, AIs to Instituto Dorado, that we will talk later, uh, to help uh, those institutions for free to test those equipments, to evaluate the project, and at the end of the day, select at least two to improve the manufacturing. Next one, please. We provide also funding around 60 million, 600 million, 600 million reais to the industry that will change their manufacturing plants to, to manufacture ventilators, such as the smartphone. Flextronics, it's an American company that they have a huge factory in Sao Paulo and they, they manufacture computers, uh, smartphones, they change their lines to manufacture ventilators. They already manufacture a thousand. Last week, they, they reached 1,000 units manufacturing, and they, 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 this kind of company can get this kind of money, very cheap money, to, to change their, their manufacturing plants to manufacturing lines, ventilator lines. Next one, please. We, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we are now with uh, an auction open. It's uh, we call in Brazil subvenção. It's a uh, non-refundable money to the companies, not for R and D centers, not for universities. This money is the money that the government is giving for free for initiatives to manufacture ventilators. We are looking to to support at least ten projects, and the same projects, each one will have a pilot lot. Uh, with the uh, around 250 uh, ventilators each one. So we expect that we will have at least 2,500 ventilators being delivered for free for the Minister of Health through this process. Next one, please. Uh, you, you are all, all also supporting uh, components and other uh, equipment that are attached to the ventilators. Uh, another one, this is only to let you know how is the process of certification in Brazil for the uh, medical devices, such as the ventilators. It's a very complex process uh, to, to allow someone to, to manufacture and sell it this in Brazil. Uh, we know that this is bureaucracy, but is the way that we can avoid uh, amateur uh, initiatives that can be sold and injure the patient. So, uh, we get a, 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 a fast, fast track for this kind of equipment. And today, if the, if the documentation is ready, the, the certification passes around four days to, to have the register and the certification from our national regulator. Uh, next one, please. Well, and th this is the last one. Uh, we, we have a partnership. Uh, the ministry together with the National Association of the Laboratories that make certification in the country. Most part of, of them are offering the infrastructure to test and validate the equipment without cost for the initiatives. So this is another one that they, they are offering. Uh, Eldorado is one of them that you talk about. And we are very glad that they help us in this direction because my, most part of the initiatives are voluntary. They, they are really helping the country to try to, to offer this kind of solution for saving lives. So next, I guess this is the last, the last one. Yes, that's it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jose. Now we will speak with Master Camila Medina, from Director of the Ministry of Costa Rica. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Thank you for participating in this dialogue with us. Okay, again, uh, thank you for the, the invitation to be at this dialogue and share with you a little bit what we have been doing in uh, Costa Rica in terms of the production of pulmonary uh, or ventilators or lung ventilators. And early on, when we had the first cases of COVID-19 in Costa Rica, the different government authorities from the presidency on down, the, the Minister of uh, Health and so on, we activated a quick response a model in the in ministry is the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology with a strategy based on the production of uh, inputs. This was uh, articulated uh, with different entities and that were showing us what the needs were uh, in the, the and what the technical certifications would be uh, to be able to uh, activate a process of cooperation that would allow for quickly putting at the available of the authorities some of these uh, uh, medical protection uh, inputs that would then uh, support them, support the health uh, authorities and along the same uh, lines. Uh, we began then in terms of this uh, quick response strategy uh, to look at what the specifications might be for uh, breathing machines or, or, or lung ventilators. And so we were with the business sector, with academe, uh, to start developing then these uh, devices. Next, please. We, to that end, the first step that we took on 16 March, we supported a, uh, an initiative with something called Colapsair, a collaboration CR meaning Costa Rica. And we're working with the academe, civil society, uh, who have worked collaboratively in the design of these first line uh, devices. Uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, lung ventilators. And there were many, many people, literally hundreds uh, involved, uh, medical centers, researchers, and so on. And among all, so as I was saying, it is important to point out because Costa Rica has a specialized cluster uh, that is quite important in the medical uh, sector, focusing in particular on export, not so much uh, the development of inputs for local consumption. And uh, so that is not what we're used to doing. And in this case in particular, uh, the uh, lung ventilators, but like I said, in, in early in March, we uh, we started working also with the Costa Rican Social Security Institute. At the beginning, we in, they uh, imported something like 75 ventilators. Uh, 
to be able to cover demand in the worst case scenarios at this point in time. The response of the authorities has led to where we have 1,194 confirmed cases, 394 uh, two, uh, cases uh, recovered, and are still uh, in a situation, a very few dead, but still in a situation uh, of death regarding these ventilators. And we need to be prepared always for the worst possible scenario, although in a fragile sort of way, the situation is still uh, under uh, control. Uh, but again, uh, we need to be prepared. So through this cooperative uh, platform in the Collab CR, uh, we made a call to all the possible and the potential stakeholders. And this um, uh, but we identified uh, experts in terms of uh, for, for materials regarding assisted ventilation at clinical design and manufacturing stage uh, to create then an equipment that would support the groups working at the different levels, company, university, on this uh, development. And uh, we also then uh, worked with international agencies, uh, Spain in particular, uh, in Colombia, a uh, University of uh, uh, Antioquia, and uh, other uh, countries. And based on this, we were able to set up a technical team made up of a companies that, uh, as I say, are part of this uh, cluster of medical devices. Um, uh, Boston Scientific, Medtronics, uh, Lantern, and so on. And uh, these then uh, proceeded to provide or, or elaborate a, a document uh, with the minimum uh, specifications that would be uh, required for the development of a, a ventilator that would uh, tropicalize, quote unquote, uh, the international standards for the security and operation of these norms, both Europeans and uh, American uh, for the, the uh, assisted medical, uh, mechanical or rather machine ventilation. And so we looked at all the uh, generated conversation with the authorities, the health authorities, to verify what the needs might be, the preparation of minimum technical uh, requirements. At the same time, and uh, we uh, and entered the discussion and put out a call through the uh, uh, Collab CR platform to start the development of a prototypes, collaborative, of course, a university and a companies uh, based on the technical specifications we had come up with. Uh, then there would, was also a technical and clinical advisory uh, services. Uh, specifically with an expert from Medtronics in the United States and at individual level with uh, experts on the manufacture of this kind of product. And uh, next slide, please. Then what we were doing in parallel then uh, was to put out a call for non-reimbursable funds for a little over a million dollars. We are uh, putting up $250,000 for a project within a 12-month development stage. And right now we're doing technical evaluations for the granting of these resources for the development of these devices. And we 
so, so that they can then finish their, their designs and clinical validation. Next. If you give us just two, two minutes here, uh, here, in fact, we, we can go to the next one. We have a total there, there. Uh, there are then uh, the core one, a total of 10 projects. There is some are in the preclinical, and other four are in the design to go into the, uh, for example, we have one called the, the Breen uh, project, which is the University of Costa Rica. Uh, and I won't go into too much detail here, but another, for example, in preclinical is the one called ITCR, uh, the Costa Rican Technological Institute, multidisciplinary uh, team made up of actors from uh, mechanics, electronics, and health uh, sectors. And just to conclude, the, as part of the process and support for uh, validation, uh, we are coordinating with the Ministry of Health, specifically the Director for the Regulation of Products of Health uh, Interest, and are right now uh, providing advisory services to the different teams in their uh, chemical and clinical uh, trials. And of course, they're working with researchers to work with this team in the preparation of the protocols. Uh, and in addition, we have activated uh, work for the uh, regulation, uh, together with the Director for Regulation of uh, Products of Sanitary Interest to give guidance to the teams that are already in the process of validation and uh, registration of the equipment and biomedical materials. So the idea is to make sure that the existing regulations for the uh, registration uh, of this equipment is uh, followed in a step-by-step -step manner, and we are able to uh, uh, move through this uh, paperwork uh, as quickly as possible. Usually it takes 90 days, but a major effort has been made, so it can be done in less than 40 uh, days, and then go through the certification and validation. We are right now working with the uh, University of Costa Rica and the Technological Institute, and as I say, we're guiding them. Uh, things are moving along, uh, and we we hope to be able then to present these devices uh, to the regulatory authorities and we hope that these ventilators will all comply with the uh, requirements. So that is very quickly, that's what we've been doing in uh, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, and, you know, there have been challenges, um, difficulties, but all in all, uh, things are moving along. Thank you most kindly. going to go to get the floor to the Maria Jose so that she can tell us her experience with Uruguay. Well, good afternoon to you all. It's a pleasure to be able to share our experience with you. I will try to be short. With After listening to the numbers of Brazil, we feel a little small, but we're still excited to give you these these numbers. When the pandemic began, it started, uh, it, it, it kick-started a lot of initiative, uh, initiatives regarding ventilators, and the ministry quickly decided to uh, send out a, a public uh, call to be able to have companies provide their, their projects and their initiatives. And so we released a uh, public elicitation so that all companies that wanted to be able to manufacture 50 uh, quick fabrication ventilators in a 30 to 45 day period would be able to do that and, and would make their offers and be able to do that. Next slide, please. So I want to show you a little bit the timeline of how the situation happened 
we have to point out two things. And the first one is that in Uruguay, we don't have any plant that manufactures a quick manufacturing ventilators. So we had to generate capabilities from scratch, from zero, and that was a challenge, and that was a, a new problem that we had to be able to overcome. So we called the interest of sectors so that so they could come together and maybe generate some solutions. So on the 13th of March, we had the first case. On the on March 23rd, we launched this, this challenge. The ventilator challenge, we call it, at the and during the first week or after the first week, we had the first proposals, and we selected two companies. And of those two companies, on May 15th, we obtained the 50 ventilators. So within the specifications, we established that they had to fulfill with international uh, manufacturing guidelines and really that was the first challenge we didn't have a mechanism to validate that these ventilators would respond because usually our ventilators are imported so as we generated the when we generated when we launched the challenge we had the curve that was increasing and we had a huge emergency and we needed to have this these ventilators available very quickly so we Thankfully, we didn't have the first cases until very um, much uh, later within the region. But so we had a little bit of time, but still we had an emergency and we had to respond. Thankfully, that curve has been decreasing after this, so we've had a little bit of time to adjust and make changes to the initial prototypes. Most of the companies that are working with us are electronic companies or medical companies, but really mostly electronic companies that were able to respond to the call, to the challenge. These are uh, Valve and Nomadic ventilators. And so what these, co what these companies did were to make a preclinical validation with, with animals, and they comply with the uh, Great Britain certification requirements. And so we had some generated for the patients in, on site in the hospital and then some for transporting patients, so mobile ventilators. These are the two models. The first one is to be, a, the one on the left is to be able to put them in the hospitals or on site where you can mix the air and oxygen and be able to control the patient's uh, respiration or breathing. And the second one to the right is the portable uh, ventilator. Please, next slide. First, we have to identify which were the first challenges that we had in this, or the first obstacles that we had in this challenge. First is to have a lack of trust in, these, in, these, in this equipment, because we don't have companies that work in this manufacturer, this particular uh, sector of manufacturing. So the medical sector had to overcome a lack of trust in how these equipments would work, which is completely understandable. But the surprise that we had was that in the technical validations were that the results were very positive, even if we haven't continued to the next stages that are still uh, in the process of being performed. The other obstacles that we had no, pro no, no specifications of our own for this type of equipment. So we're working already in generating these because these are not the only respirator ventilators that initiatives that, that exist. We've had a lot of other very interesting initiatives. So we have to generate our own guidelines and specifications and that's what we're doing. We are generating a, a process of validation. And so these first versions of certification requirements are for these times of emergencies. These will not be commercialized as, as normal ventilators that could be exported, for example. These are specifically for certifying equipment to be used in cases of extreme necessity when there are no other options at a commercial level that are, have been calibrated and have fulfilled all commercial certifications. 
but because of the moment, the emergency that we had at the time, we needed to speed this process up and, and use these, these this equipment. But right now that we have the curve um, being a lot, uh, a lot less and, and, and we have this curve flattening, then we have a little bit more time to adjust and, and make these processes better. It's important to point out that it was important that these companies were able to manufacture these 50 ventilators uh, as quickly as possible. We had a prototype and we had preclinical certifications done on this prototype really quickly, and then we just went ahead and authorized the production of these 50 ventilators because uh, we needed them in the moment. And we realized if we have that capability of doing that so quickly and, and responding with a product that was that worked and, and was effective, we know that we have uh, this, these capabilities in country and we have to develop and see which markets we have and how we can definitely potentialize this effort. Um, and at the moment, of course, we're talking about certifications in times of need and in times of emergency, but the idea is to be able to develop this initiative uh, further. We are getting help from the Ministry of Health uh, for establishing what are the important requirements because they know more than anyone what we are actually certifying. And we are working on initiatives that are much more formal, much more organized so that we can expand and we can promote this initiative as much as, as possible. And right now we have these ventilators, for example, that thank God, because the curve has flattened, uh, we, uh, we don't have to use them yet, but we also have another initiative and another and other efforts going on at the same time that are generating even better prototypes and even better equipment. And we don't have the initial necessity or the initial urgency anymore. So that's allowing us to go through these processes at a much slower pace and develop them properly. We, this is a team that has been working on on these initiatives and they have been very enthusiastic and, and very hardworking, almost really at a volunteer capacity because they've been working really for the people and for, the, for helping the population. And I just want to thank them because they've been working very intensely. They've had very long nights to be able to release this equipment. And as you can see, they had amazing results and we were very surprised and very pleased. And that's all I, I have to say for the moment. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Maria Jose. I think the last words that you said are shared by all of us. And the importance then of of uh, sharing uh, the knowledge that you have to be able to find a solution. So that was a very, very valuable and it's a common pattern that we find in all the different countries and that's where these initiatives are born. So we have now a few questions um, and a few uh, for some, some time for a bit of an exchange. Are there any questions on the regulatory issues? But uh, Alexandre, uh, do you want to start tackling some of the questions? Sure, I can do that. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Thank you for to our panelists. Great presentations. There are some. There's some questions that are more specific to panelists and others more general. So I'll just go in the order that I uh, got them. And let me try to, to uh, answer some of these uh, if you agree. So we have here a question from a colleague in Colombia, the Chilean Marcela Morales Chances from in Lima, uh, Colombia. And she is asking for how long it takes 
the authorities uh, to uh, to approve a mechanical or machine uh, ventilator. And that's really more for the regulators. Uh, but maybe some of our panelists could share with us how long it took or may take uh, in their countries, because there's some collaboration going on as we have uh, with authorities in the country who are accompanying the uh, process. So I, I then I? refer to Ayala. Bon chico. May I? In Mexico. In Brazil. And asking uh, what parameters uh, were uh, they used to look at the evaluated uh, the evaluated ventilators. And then from Brazil, a question on the recommendation of not using manual resuscitation uh, bags for more than six hours. And the question is, do you have documentary evidence that you could share with us? This is uh, Roberto Ayala also in Mexico. Here also, yeah, I don't know if we want to, guys want to have a, a round of answers now or May I? again, Roberto. And uh, now for Costa Rica is if the Colab CR platform um, can uh, open to other developers as well. And then also, if you, Rolando Carmona, how long has it taken from the beginning to the current certification stage on average? He says, I am part of a multidisciplinary council uh, on COVID-19. Thank you, uh, Rolando. In, in the National University of Chile. Uh, and there is uh, to, to uh, talk about uh, the issue of imports, possibly from China or so on, of these equipments that you need. And we also have here Rodrigo Olivares, a is specific for Uruguay. Is it possible to share these models and, and, and possibly imitate or improve them? And last question, also Roberto Ayala of Cinetech. Is there a protocol for preclinical tests uh, done with uh, animals, uh, a preclinical essay is done with animals. And sorry, not the last one. There's one from Francisco Olivares, again from Mexico. What has the most significant barrier been to the development of these ventilators? And uh, more questions. So we, we, We'll have to, I don't think we have time for two rounds. One, Maria Angela, uh, Angela uh, Herrera from uh, Bolivia. What are the minimum requirements requested by the Costa Rican authorities? Uh, this is for Costa Rica and Uruguay. And, okay, lots of questions, lots of interest for the issues on, on the subject, uh, rather. So I suggest we do a single round and just keep in mind, we will having then another panel at this moment. Right, so uh, each panelist then can take up uh, some of the questions they would be interested in answering. Uh, maybe for uh, reasons of time or time constraints, uh, uh, of which we don't have enough, uh, just a single round of answers. So I'll go to the English uh, room and there's Al uh, will go to English. Uh, so, and then immediately we will start with Jose Gotijo of Brazil, who is also in the English room. Uh, so he can speak 
and then we go to Spanish and back, back to the Spanish room and go. So uh, Francisco, I pass it to you and uh, you pass it on to Jose Gautier. Thank you, Tomas. So we have a question here. It's from Lucy Nadkarni and I'm from University of Vermont. And it's asking uh, whether is there a centralized data collection bank to know these different parameters, the respiratory physicians, regulations, electricity, availability of oxygen, etc. Thanks for the question. And now we go to Gontijo. Oh, thank you. Uh... I, I, I will focus on maybe, uh, there are too, ma too many questions. I will focus maybe uh, the time to certification in Brazil, it depends. Uh, usually if all the documentation is ready and they submit it to a visa, that's our regulatory agency, it takes four days. But it's very uh, common, but it's happened that the, the regulator asks and requires some uh, technical complement information for the, the the, the projects and maybe regarding of that this can take a little bit more uh, there is one case that the company is already in two weeks trying to solve the problem that the regulator found and update they solve that they cannot uh, give the certification and other ones they submit everything they get their answer in four days uh, regarding the the time of usage of the uh, uh, ventilate manual ventilators or automated ventilators based on Ambu uh, most part of the intensive care uh, doctors, they argue that more than six hours uh, can get, give some injuries in the, in the lung of the patients. And more than that, uh, the AMBU, the way that the AMBU works, they send uh, aerosols, they send uh, contaminate air in the environment. And then the, the the professionals, the health professionals, and the, the other patients that don't have COVID, they can get injured with COVID using this kind of solution. So it's not that it's forbidden to be used, but if you use it, you have to know the risks. And as the government, uh, we are buying a lot of ventilators, we cannot uh, uh, permit this kind of initiative. If some hospital would like to have this kind of thing, they have to accomplish the regulatory requirements. Otherwise, no hospital will use it. And at the, at, up to today, since the beginning of the crisis, no uh, automated AMBU gets a reg register or, cert or cert certification from the regulatory uh, agents. So that's it. Much, Dr. Cortijo. So we give the floor to Dr. Diego from Argentina. Uh, just very briefly, uh, 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 and so to, I think uh, Roberto Ayala, thank you Roberto for the question. It's very difficult um, to, you know, what we did in Argentina was four ministries, uh, health, science and technology, productive development and defense. Uh, set up basically an articulating table uh, with different interdisciplinary competences. One first step was to identify uh, the research being done by the different companies, universities, the public sector, and so on. I identify the projects, they try to evaluate them, and the evaluation had to do first with sending films, photographs, and then, of course, an in situ visit on how the projects were being developed. And in all cases, or, or most of them, uh, we then decided, uh, you know, which were the most viable uh, projects, and they are now already in the process of certification. And not just the engineers that worked on the project, but also the advisory services uh, at provincial or municipal uh, level. And we then realized we could gain time by parallel to development, already get the regulating entity uh, while things are still being developed. Um, the provinces 
have a certain autonomy in terms of their rather regulatory. And I don't want to get into detail how much they have, but they do have some uh, uh, regulatory autonomy. And that means they can accompany the, the, the companies or universities as they develop these devices. And we figured we could gain some time by having them uh, be during the process of learning where we've got to the point where we felt that what should happen is that simultaneous with the development of the technology, the health sector, of course, has to be there, uh, intensive uh, therapists, uh, doctors, and so on. But the regulatory entity should be right there to accompany in the final phases of development so that when you get to the certification stage, there's already a certain amount of interaction, a certain affinity, uh, as it were, between what was being developed and the regulating entity, and then hopefully it can and should go much faster. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hurtado. Very good answer and very instructive. We can you with uh, Carolina. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, to answer his questions, um, uh, like I said, we have a collaborative platform where the developments can ac gain access. People from academe can gain access. Uh, to the collab uh, CR, and this is at national. It's an open platform. It's an open platform, and you can go in and find the uh, technical requirements, and they're available to the entire uh, uh, Latin American community uh, with no problem at all. The second question regarding uh, challenges. Uh, basically, Costa Rica has not had historically uh, local manufacture of this kind of device and to suddenly start producing it um, was a, a bit of a problem. But on the other hand, uh, there has been experience uh, and, and uh, in the production of uh, other types of uh, devices or machinery, usually for uh, export, but at least in areas very different than this, but still the experience was there. And that was, I think, the first obstacle we faced. The second uh, one was uh, technical in, in nature. The available uh, availability uh, of electronic devices, that has been a difficulty. What we did was we activated collaboration with the cluster of electronic devices that exists in Costa Rica. So through their networks, we will be able then to acquire some uh, devices, but that's still a problem. And the third is that the country doesn't really have a specific norm uh, for medical uh, devices. Because as I said, we're not used to producing them. So uh, we are now working with the health authorities um, in each of the phases. And uh, there were some consultations and that at the beginning we weren't able to answer. We're working on them as things have been uh, developing when we were working with the health authorities uh, with whom we have a close authority and we as ministry are working as basically as, as articulators, as coordinators of the entire effort. Thank you. And Maria Jose. Very good questions regarding the import of the, the parts. In import, there wasn't too much problem with uh, that. And and so there were already there were already companies importing electronic parts and so and so uh, they basically got into the country in April uh, and there was no no major delay there um, and and there were already other uh, to get respirators into the country took a little bit longer but not not for the electronic parts then we 
also uh, purchases are done with some very general norms and regulations, um, but to not get bogged down in technicalities, uh, we work with national authorities uh, and Uh, working with HMRA in, in Great Britain, for example. Uh, we also looked at the norms in Argentina and as I say, the, the English norms. Um, and, and basically are based on those we're sort of developing our own as we as we move uh, forward. And yes, there is availability of these models to emulate them and contribute a more and uh, our team is able to uh, install these equipments, show you how it works and even when that and when they develop uh, when they when they deliver rather the uh, ventilators um, they they show people a, and train them on how to use them, so I hope we will be able to work together on that front as well. Thank you very much, Maria Jose. So we could, of course, continue for uh, a long time further, but we have another block of presentation. We're running a little bit late, so I would just like to clarify, we in the work that we did to uh, identify, and this was started over a month ago, but as we identified at the beginning of our work, there's been some projects. And, and as I said, we know these aren't all. I said 20, but there's many more. There are other initiatives in many uh, part, uh, different uh, countries. And we are open to continue uh, incorporating new experiences. So it would be good if the group that's working, if any of the projects that are not reflected here, as I see there are many, and we took just really a small sample of the many, many initiatives that uh, exist throughout the region, and we hereby invite you to share with us to identify and record uh, additional projects. And now, Alexandre, I do give you the floor so we can open the next block. And there were other questions, but there's just not enough time, unfortunately. And I apologize here for those. I apologize to those that we haven't been able to, to answer uh, right now. But all the questions that were not answers will be answered then um, in, in writing or, or other forms of contact. Here we have a, with us Mrs. Cesar Muniz from Cuba. And here he is talking about some Regulations in Cuba, we have uh, incorporated some of the ventilators in all the most advanced projects to reduce the time needed for the evaluation and approval of this equipment. So thank you, Dr. Muniz, for your participation. And again, uh, my apologies to those we were not able, whose questions were not able to answer, but in uh, deference to those, we have only 30 more minutes we have to continue with the panel. So in this second part of our webinar, we are going to hear some projects that are in different stages of development in the region and from outside the region. And we will have examples from Brazil, uh, the United States, and Spain, um, and Trinidad and Tobago as well. So five minutes per presentation so that we stay within the overall time frame. So the first presentation 
Dr. Jose Eduardo Bertuso from the Bauma Eduardo and the Eduardo Institute in Brazil. Dr. Bertuso, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and sharing with you guys, gentlemen, uh, you know, our experience on this. Before starting in the project by itself, just would like to highlight some of the activities we are doing on the COVID-19 here in Brazil. As Mr. Gontijo said, uh, we first engaged by helping one of the private, private companies in Brazil uh, that were already producing ventilators, Intermed. They used to produce around 1,500 to 2,000 ventilators per year and we engaged with them in order to enhance their capability so of production. In 10 times, that was the, the challenge, right? So uh, we apply some automation and um, manufacturing 4.0, you know, techniques, uh, and, you know, keeping this, you know, because uh, there are medical, uh, electromedical products, you need to take care about a lot of aspects of the production to keep the certification. So it suits it. And we were able to deploy the, you know, the automation necessary to, to enhance the production from 10 ventilators per day to 100 per day with this uh, private company. As well as Mr. Gontiju said, we are also a certified lab for electromedical device under the ISO 17025, we do electrical safety and electromagnetic compatibility. And uh, we work again uh, with our association and we are able to provide free developing and certification testing for the community that were developing uh, ventilators in Brazil. And that had to the grant that we got from ministry to help even further to develop uh, full production on some of those ventilators. Then come up to Baumer. Baumer is a private company that we used to work for a long time here in Brazil in developing medical equipment. And they had this uh, anesthetic uh, machine with a built-in ventilator, right? And fully featured with all the volume control, pressure assisted, synchronized intermittent, all pressure support, all inverted radio kind of capability already built in. But uh, a bigger machine with a built-in uh, ventilator. The idea and the challenge was to very quickly, two and a half months ago, to defeature that machine and keep only the ventilator and run all the tests necessary and submit to the local agents this new equipment with prototypes. So uh, we did so and uh, we were able uh, to, to finalize very quickly this, uh, this design and we were able, as you can see in the in the standard compliance, we were able to, to uh, get the compliance under 86012-12, uh, which is uh, specific for ventilators, right? So it is uh, now a full feature product for uh, intensive care. And if you could please uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, we were able, we submit, you know, as, uh, roughly five weeks ago, we submit to our local agents on visa, and we got uh, the certification for ventilation. That allow us to start first production like three weeks ago. And uh, last week, we sent the first batch of products to one city here in Campinas in, 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 in Brazil, in Northeast of Brazil, right? Also, we had to take care about uh, Alternate sourcing some for some critical components, especially the closed sensor and the pressure sensor. And uh, now, right now, we are doing with Baumer the same kind of work we did for Intermed, which is to to uh, uh, out, do the automation for the calibration and everything necessary to increase their capability in terms of production. The target is to reach something around 500 to 1,000 per month, all right? And, uh, you know, just to answer some of the questions that you guys uh, sent us, you know, the company has, uh, you know, distributors all over the region. And up to now, there's no plans for tech, any technology transfers. But of course, you know, there's something that uh, could be 
you know, negotiate with, uh, especially with Bomber. All right. That's it. Very quickly presentation. Thank you very much. For your presentation, let us advance then directly to the uh, of the uh, of a project I called Andalusia Respira or Andalusia Breathes, and Dr. Munoz uh, will address us. Uh, hi, um, who we. There's two parts. There's one that's more clinical and one that's more uh, the engineering uh, aspect. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be the one that I'm going to be starting, first of all. Say hello to all of you that are here in this webinar. We're, we hope that you guys don't go through our the issues we've had. Our ventilator was produced in a situation of collapse. We needed to have a ventilator that would co comply with the characteristics that you would see in the screen. Please speak a little bit slower because of the translators. Yes, of course. So our project, as I was saying, was uh, born as a result of a, of a collapse of the medical system in Spain. So if you need a lot of ventilators, you will need them in a very short amount of time, from a few weeks to a month. So our objective was not to develop an equipment that was similar to the commercial ventilators, but a, an equipment that was easy, it was efficient to solve the crisis that we had, we were facing, and realized that we didn't have a lot of capabilities to do it. Our equipment is designed for COVID cases specifically. It has pressure control mode, and we it's, it's mainly directed towards towards um, the patients that are in the emergency unit, which is the care unit. It's it's a low cost equipment. We are a non non lucrative organization, an NGO, and we had to design something that was for long term use for our patients. It was not a commercial ventilator. It's low cost. It's royalty free. It's quick, to, it's quick to build so that we can provide medical attention to the patients that needed a ventilator in an emergency context. We will talk about the, equip, the improvements that we made on the software throughout the different months. We have a digital kit that it's controlled by a automatic valve. We can reach volumes over a liter a minute, and it's ready to respond to any kind of um, need of ad ad adaption or adapting any kind of equipment from the Britain or American models. For the next slide, for the values that you see on the screen, you can see that there are different settings. It controls the flows for, for the patients, low pressure or high pressure, for example. And as a doctor, my opinion is that in a real situation or of a collapse due to COVID, we needed equipment that would adjust to the needs that were real. And if we had to build a 
different equipments to respond to this emergency specifically, that's what we did so that we were able to provide care to the patients who needed them so that at the end of the process, we were able to use the ventilators for patients that needed constant and mandated ventilate, a ventilator. In regards to the requirements, it can be connected to any, to any grid, 110 or 220 voltage. It uses a NIST connector, which is ideal for hospital oxygen. It could be connected to the wall fixture or to the to a involuntary tank. It has it needs an external mixer. This ventilator is for is used specifically for what it needs to be used, which is to keep somebody alive. And it definitely takes care of the needs of a COVID patient. Patient. It's very small. It fits on a emergency, emergency. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, I'm not done in this one. Sorry. It has a uninterrupted air uh, oxygen flow, oxygen supply flow. Has the ability to switch among traditional software advanced or improved software, and we're just developing a new software, and we're still testing it, and it's still going through certification, and it doesn't require changing the hardware, but it does increase the, the, the use of the equipment, because it can, you can introduce more alarms, and it allows you to have a UV assisted ventilation system. What we have to do is to have the, the, the go ahead of the controlling agency. We need to verify, we need to have the different, we need to have compliance with different requirements that are dictated by the MHRA um, and the document certification information that you saw down there at the at the bottom right corner of the slide. It's approved for clinical trials, and it's been we've done tests, radiomagnetic tests, and basic security tests for 14 day a uh, 14 day insurance endurance test as well. It complies with the rapidly manufactured ventilation system certification requirements. We're still completing security tests, magnetic, electromagnetic testing as well. We're still in the process of completing. This ventilator was complete, was manufactured completely with collaboration with different entities. And we are trying to also sign a collaboration agreement that will include uh, the license, licensing, adv technical advice, training for the use of the device. And we still have to overcome a test so that it's legal to be used. So we will provide technical advice for that specific um, testing for, for complying with certification requirement so that it can be legally used in different countries. So with the information that we have, we're willing to do any transfer of technology and information. Thank you so much for these experiences from Spain. We're a little bit behind schedule. So we have another five minutes for the presentations that share the experiences from Trinidad and Tobago, our friends from Trinidad and Tobago and West Indies. And I would like to give the floor to Professor Jeevan Bursant so that he can uh, 
have the, the floor so he can do the presentation. Please go ahead, Jeevan. Good afternoon to colleagues from all institutions participating in this webinar. My name is Jeevan Prasad, and I'm part of a team at the University of the West Indies here in the Caribbean, which is involved in the design and manufacture of medical devices and PPE. Today, I will be presenting information on our ventilator product called the UEVent, and I would like to start off by describing our design and testing process. Next slide, please. For our current work, there are three main areas under design and testing, which include establishment of the ventilator specification, producing the functional prototype, and testing of the product. For the establishment of the specifications, we reviewed many open source ventilator designs as well as commercial products. This work was done in conjunction with experts from our Ministry of Health. Coming out of this process, we identified the critical features of the ventilator that were needed in order to safely treat a patient. For the engineering design and prototype implementation, we have several teams who are focused on the various aspects of the ventilator, including controls, electronics, software, and power management. And for the validation of the ventilator, we are using calibration equipment specific to the ventilator testing, which includes an analyzer and a lung simulator. I will now speak further about the regulatory standards that we considered in developing the ventilator. Next slide, please. The main guide used by our team for the design of the UEVent is the UK Rapidly Manufactured Ventilator Specification. The eight additional standards listed on this slide were also referenced by our team in designing our ventilator and also serve as a guide for understanding the certification and testing process which would be undertaken for our product. I will now describe the main modes of our ventilator. Next slide, please. The main modes of our ventilator was selected after extensive consultation with our Ministry of Health. The modes are categorized as either invasive or non-invasive. As this slide shows, there are seven main invasive modes and two non-invasive modes. I will now discuss matters related to production capacity and distribution. Next slide, please. The creation of our ventilator is a multi-sectoral undertaking and two of our key partners are our manufacturing sector and our health sector. We are working with these stakeholders to locally produce and validate a production-ready UE vent ventilator. Once we have achieved this milestone, our next goal would be to consider the needs of the Caribbean region and then take an even wider view based on where there is demand. And as we consider all of this, we will be growing our production and distribution capacity in conjunction with our stakeholders. I will now discuss the question of technology transfer. Next slide, please. For the UE event, there are two technology transfer tools being utilized. These include license agreements with external manufacturers, and collaborative research agreements with key local manufacturing partners who support activities involving product development or product certification. As the ventilator is made available to a wider market, the goal is to use targeted agreements covering licensing, manufacturing, and distribution on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide, please. This brings me to the end of my presentation. At this time, I would like to acknowledge my team members who are participating in this webinar, as well as our principal, Professor Copeland, and project leader, Professor Agard, all of whom have been and continue to work extremely hard supporting these efforts. I thank all of you for your attention and opportunity to share our work.
Thank you, Jivan Prasad, for your experiences. They were very interesting. We are going directly to Jason Bates, who will present the experience of a project for the Claremont ventilator. Please, Jason, you have the Thank you very much. This is Jason Bates speaking from the University of Vermont. And I greatly appreciate this opportunity to talk to you today about our mechanical ventilator project and prototype called the Vermontilator. We come from Vermont, we call it the Vermontilator. <clears throat> and it is an emergency ventilator designed from the ground up specifically for the COVID crisis. The University of Vermont UVM team that has been working intensively on this project for more than the last two months has grown to become quite large and involves um, a number of people with different expertise, including some on this call. But it began with my interactions with four engineers from our professional machine shop at the university, Michael Lane, the director, and Carl, Jake, and Guy, who are professional research engineers and very skilled fabricators and designers. <clears throat> and the vision for the ventilator that was motivated by what was happening in our own medical intensive care unit and influenced very much by my own research over the last nearly two decades, led us to produce a device that delivers airway pressure release ventilation or APRV. I've been doing basic research into the mechanisms of ventilator-induced lung injury and lung mechanics my entire career. And so when I saw clinical evidence that APRV was effective in COVID-19, it immediately made sense to me. And so I worked with the engineers to come up with a very simple, essentially mechanical device that would reliably and simply apply airway pressure release ventilation. Uh, the main motivation for using airway pressure release ventilation is that there are theoretical and practical reasons, which I don't have time to go into right now, as to why APRV is protective against ventilator-induced lung injury. And this is critically important when you're managing a patient with inflamed lungs, such as happens in COVID-19 because if the wrong type of ventilation is applied to patients with this condition, you can destroy the lungs. You can mechanically damage it and that can be fatal. So it's very important to attend to the possibility that ventilator-induced lung injury can occur and to ventilate in a way that attempts to prevent it. So APRV is very simple and I've got stylized uh, graphs of the pressure and flow waveforms that are applied. These are highly stylized, so there would be noise associated with these in a real life case. But essentially, inspiration is created by applying a fixed high pressure, we call it P high, for a duration of time during which inspiration occurs. And this is a relatively long time compared to the duration of the entire breath, because expiration occurs when you remove that high pressure and replace it with a low pressure, which in our case is zero relative to atmosphere, so that you allow brief expirations before reinflating the lung back up to its inflated state again. <clears throat> and the reason why this has advantages in terms of avoiding ventilator-induced lung injury is because it, these brief expirations do not give the lung enough time to collapse so that epithelial surfaces come together then have to be peeled apart again during the next inspiration because that is extremely damaging to the lung tissue. So next slide. So I show here on the left a diagram of an earlier prototype and I show this earlier prototype being tested with a mechanical lung and a meter recording the pressures and flows because you can get a better idea of how it works compared to the final prototype for production, which is shown on the right. Now, the image on the left is actually a video. Is it possible to hit that and have it run? Can you start that video? 
I'm sorry, I'm afraid it doesn't work uh, no. with the way. Okay. okay, well, not to worry. If it had gone, what you would see, that circular the clear disc in the back, behind that is a rotating vein. And there's a slot in the vein that every rotation comes into coincidence with the, whole, with the opening in the outer disc. And when that happens, you have the brief period of expiration. And the rest of the time, the gas pressure source behind that unit applies a constant inspiration to the uh, lung, in this case, the lung analog. And you can see from the waveform on the meter there that we have protracted inspirations with brief expirations. <clears throat> and on the right, you can see the final prototype. And this includes a safety alarm monitoring system that monitors against overpressurization, filters being clogged, motor temperature, um, sensor faults, and there's a backup battery that makes sure the sensor keeps operating and will has the capability to sound an alarm, even if power to the ventilator itself somehow fails. There's a switch which allows you to choose three different breath periods. And in future models, we're going to have a data output link there shown by the USB connector. <clears throat> so gas comes in one end, goes out to the patient, goes through the device out to the patient, and then back in through the unit for expiration to be controlled by that rotating disc. So it's small size, it weighs about 10 pounds, it's, uh, and it's got a transport handle. There's a safety pressure release valve on the inspiratory line, so the pressure cannot possibly be suddenly overpressurized in the case of any failure of the gas source. It's undergone extensive testing, and we began interacting with the FDA in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration, about a month ago concerning their emergency use approval program. Um, we sent in an initial proposal. They gave us feedback. We did extensive testing, design modification, and advancement of the device over the past month. And just today, I was able to send back a whole package containing all the information they require to the FDA and I'm hopeful that we will hear back from them in a positive way fairly soon. Next slide, please. So we have arranged manufacturing and distribution through a partner in Vermont, who is ISO 9001 and 13485 approved. So we have the logistics for producing and distributing these things in place. Training to use the device is quick and straightforward because it is so simple. There's almost no adjustment to be made, and we anticipate developing tools, training tools, in native languages as required. It also being essentially mechanical, apart from the monitoring system, is very simple in its operation and therefore simple for biomedical technicians in the field to repair it should that be needed. We have a patent pending, it's owned by the University of Vermont, However, we will have, we will have non-exclusive licensing during the period of the pandemic. The final thing I'd like to say is we have three uh, Masters of Business Administration students at the university who have been leading the analysis of the business side of this endeavor. Um, and one who is on this call is focused particularly on international manufacturing and distribution. So we are all very interested to hear the situation in other countries, particularly South America, our neighbor to the south. And we hope that we can help you folks down there somehow with the project that is now essentially ready to go and uh, has reached, I think, a, a, a very advanced stage of development. And with that, I will pass it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for presenting your information and your experience at the University of Vermont. Um, I would like to mention that the University of Vermont is 100% collaborative with the oh. have a very advanced uh, 
project now in terms of technology development. So thank you very much, Doctor, for sharing your experience with us. We now then the last presentation. Five minutes more of patience. We beg of you. And we had uh, 130 participants. So we're very, very pleased about that and would ask Stephen Arms of the Auto Vent Project to use his five minutes to share his experience uh, 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 at uh, Auto Vents. Steve? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that, yes. Yes. Very grateful to be here. Um, next slide, please. So the design process for in the process or the design process for the um, automatic bag vent machine was intended to be uh, safe, simple, reliable, easy to put together, and low cost. Next slide. We began this project uh, and and got to a pre-production prototype within four weeks. Uh, here you can see at Beta Technologies, which is an aircraft manufacturer, our lineup of machines uh, that uh, run continually um, and the, the little production facility that we created that uh, allows us to put these things together. So it takes about 20 minutes to uh, put one of these machines together currently. Next slide. Uh, in, in order to uh, program this machine, uh, you press buttons. So you, uh, the user pushes little buttons and the buttons change the tidal volume and the rates. And uh, it also allows you the user to view the plateau and peak pressures that are being delivered. Um, when we program the machine, we need to, it has an internal microprocessor and that microprocessor controls the movement of the arms of the machine the depth of penetration of the arms into the bag sets up the tidal volume. So we, we do that for a compliant lung, um, and that's deliberate on our part because it's easy to push air into a compliant lung. Uh, so then if we're presented with a, a patient that has a, a, a stiff lung or a reduced compliance, then that will inherently protect them. Next slide, please. This is a, a typical uh, waveforms. These are waveforms for pressure in red and tidal uh, velocity in, in liters per minute in green. And uh, the tidal velocity is measured with a sensorian flow sensor and the pressure is measured with a Honeywell pressure transducer. And you can see as the lungs become less compliant, the pressures increase and the tidal flows decrease, which is what you would expect. But we, in all cases, we never want to exceed 40 centimeters of water. Now the AMBU bag that we use has a pressure relief valve that's set for 40 centimeters. So that, that protects, uh, in addition to the alarms that are built into the system, uh, the uh, redundant pressure limiting valve on the AMBU bag that we specify also provides protection. So you can see that the tidal volume, well, it's hard to see it, but I can tell you the tidal volume measured with a Ferrari respirometer uh, gets reduced when we go to the less compliant lungs. So at a setting of 600 cc's volume, which is the maximum setting in 18 breaths per minute, we only get 530 cc's when the lung compliance is reduced to 20 and 360 cc's when it's reduced to 10. So we're protecting the patient. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things we found was working with AMBU bags, how you hold them is really important. And in our original design, we were holding it in a little, a little oval cradle that you see there at, at the bottom on the left. Uh, what I found was by elevating the bag and getting the bag up relative to the enclosure of the machine, it works better. Um, basically, you have a system that is more efficient. So for the same amount of arm movement, you get more tidal volume because the bag is less constrained in the system on the right. Next slide, please. The other problem we had in our original design is that the bag was getting pinched. And for some AMBU bags, the disposable ones, for example, uh, which are made of a material that 
is environmentally friendly, um, it, unfortunately, uh, we found that it would degrade when cycled in these machines, and particularly when the ones that uh, where they're too low. Uh, so when we modified that design, there's no pinching, and we have a more efficient system. So that's something I'd like to share with, with everyone and anyone who's working with these bags. If you squeeze them horizontally, they need to be free to move vertically. Next slide, please. So the vent modes are simple. Um, there, it's pressure limited volume control. We have alarms for overpressure, underpressure, power disconnect, uh, excess motor current or motor faults and sensor faults. Um, the IE ratio is fixed at one to two, but in fact it is programmable. Uh, a user could connect to a USB port internal to the device and program basically any IE ratio that they wanted to. But we uh, have it fixed currently just to simplify the machine and simplify our testing. Uh, the tidal volumes are, uh, as I said, are programmable with buttons on the machine. And uh, the pressure is limited to 40 centimeters of H2O. The flow rates uh, are 6 to 15 liters per minute. Next slide. Next slide, please. The purpose of the device is strictly for an emergency use during a COVID-19 pandemic. We put a sterile AMBU bag uh, into the system and we place the unit very, very close to the patient because it's small and it can um, be placed very close. That means we minimize the dead air space. We use a medical grade power supply that conforms to IEC standards and we have been uh, working with the FDA. We're now in our, in our third response to the FDA, providing them with uh, technical data um, and hopefully to get an emergency use authorization. Next slide. Our production capacity really at Beta is limited. We have an order from the University of Vermont to deliver 50 of the um, automatic bag vent machines. But really, uh, we can make hundreds of data, and we, we're good at it. We have, we have the ability to do this. But to produce them in larger quantities, like thousands, we need a qualified partner or qualified partners. We have posted uh, detailed specs of all the components, and we've invited manufacturers to quote them. Next slide, please. Our sales and distribution plan is rather simple. Um, we have a parts cost of $600. It takes about 20 minutes to assemble these machines and calibrate the pressure transducer and test it. Uh, we can provide kits to qualified companies and they could assemble them using our instructions. And uh, we could envision using distribution networks to provide these kits wherever they're needed. Next slide, please. We are a not-for-profit foundation. The entire design is open source. But we need qualified medical equipment manufacturing partners to help us through this pandemic. Our partners will have, of course, have to follow the guidelines of their countries and their hospitals and provide training to respiratory therapists. Next slide. I really, I need to thank um, the folks at Beta. They're incredible, um, innovative, hardworking engineers. Um, all the support I get from Beta Technologies is just amazing. And uh, Dr. Hamlin and Vivek Chidineni have been incredible. Their guidance uh, from the University of Vermont has been um, just stellar and just incredibly responsive. We are supported by the state of Vermont to deliver the 50 ventilators to the University of Vermont. But our vision is to help people worldwide. And I'd like to know how we can do that. I'd, I'd like to hear more from anyone who's interested in partnering with us. Thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you um, for that, for sharing that experience with us. And it has been a very uh, interesting and successful session, of course, very intense with a uh, big agenda. Uh, lots of material, two hours and 12 minutes. Thank you all very much for your patience. And we had at one point 130 participants.
uh, on this uh, issue for an issue that is technical, new for many, um, many new challenges. So it really has generated a tremendous amount of interest. We're very, very uh, pleased and it's been an interesting uh, session. We will share the links and all presentations you have uh, access to them. I once again want to apologize to all of those who sent questions. And especially now in the second session right now, we won't be able to answer it. Really, people have other commitments, they have things to do, they've committed enough time. But our team will gather all these questions and I promise you we will be sending answers back to you uh, so that you get feedback uh, from us. Unfortunately, uh, Ms. Anna Polas was going to uh, uh, is in Geneva and she was going to give us a closing address, uh, uh, but uh, she cannot, was not able to connect. We would then do it ourselves. We thank you once again. We thank the interpreters uh, and the uh, team, the overall. I, I can't name everyone. Thomas, Keith and Joe, we've been coordinating this uh, working group. But there is a team behind all this that's worked very, very hard. I can't, I'm not going to take, you know, I'm talking about time all the, and, and, and I might leave somebody out, which would be unfair. But again, thanking all our team, everyone in, 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 in the English uh, chat room and Spanish chat room. Jan has worked very hard on this to organize this uh, session. Uh, that we have just held. So again, thank you to everyone who has worked on this to make this webinar possible. And in particular, to all of you for participating. Above all, the panelists uh, that have uh, worked. I thank you again for your dedication, for your patience, uh, and having been here today with us. So then we bid you a fond farewell. We wish you an excellent uh, weekend with your family, with Good health. We stay in touch. Uh, our work continues. We'll be updating information with you. And as soon as we have any other public activity, we will, of course, let you know, send invitations, documents, and be, again, uh, in, uh, in touch. And as I say, you will get feedback on the session we have just had. Once again, thank you very much and have an excellent week.